Dr. Barry Kahn. He is the CEO of QQ. So Barry, would you start out by sharing a little bit about what your company does? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> we help sports teams and other entertainment organizations price tickets. Um, we are a software business, but we do dabble on the consultancy side. And so really what we do is we come in and you know, we help our clients create a ticketing strategy and we help to automate that strategy. Um, so, you know, an end consumer would never deal with QQ. They wouldn't know who we are, but, you know, they would still buy tickets through Ticketmaster or various other ticketing systems, but we kind of interface between the ticketing system and the teams to help manage pricing of tickets. Awesome. So your company, QQ, recently got into pricing on the secondary market. How is that different from pricing on the primary market? So when we, <clears throat> when we started off, I think we had this premise that we would be able to really kind of clean up the inefficiencies of the industry by being more efficient with pricing. So, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at the ticketing space, it's one of those few industries where you have this secondary market of tickets that get resold. And it's not like the auto industry where there's a huge, you know, car resale market, hmm. but people drive cars for a few years and then want to sell them. You know, here it's someone buying something you know, never using it and, and reselling it. And so, you know, we thought that <clears throat> if we just got better about pricing, we could, you know, kind of help help our clients, the teams, the, you know, the event promoters capture that revenue. And what we realized as we got into it is that helps. Um, there's certainly revenue gains and efficiency gains from doing that. But there's this huge sort of there's this huge need for additional distribution. So mm -hmm. companies like StubHub, um, Ticketmaster on the resale product, companies like Vivid Seats um, and SeatGeek have done this great job at driving people to their sites and their locations to buy tickets. And our clients were missing out a lot or are missing out a lot if their inventory isn't there where people actually want to buy, want to buy that inventory. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it's it's been a really interesting pricing problem for us. You know, on the primary side, it's almost like you're a monopoly pricing tickets. You are the only person selling them. So your questions aren't, you know, who am I pricing against or what's the competition? It's kind of what's the demand for my product look like? How do I want to price different areas of the building to fill up the stadium in a certain way? When we shift it over to the resale side, a lot of it is, it's almost more like stock pricing in a way. You have these other products being sold, they're being sold right alongside you, and so you know you need to compete against that. And so, for instance, our dynamic pricing on the primary market, we're changing prices you know, roughly on a daily basis. On the resale side, it's hourly or even quicker than that. And yeah. so you know, you, it's a much more fast-paced market. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, on the primary side, you have big blocks of seats that you're pricing. So you might price your lower box seats all at a single price because that's how you do it at the box office. That's what makes it simple. On the secondary market, you have these things broken up into sets of two and four, and you actually have to price every listing separately. So if you have, even within the same section, row two and row four, those are totally different prices. Yeah. And, and how your tickets compare to the other ones around you and how to price accordingly. Absolutely. So we're starting to see reports that some sports, baseball in particular, have been seeing declining attendance numbers. Why do you think that is? And do you think that there's anything that can be done from a ticketing side to address that issue? So, I mean, I think one of the big issues, um, you know, re that we're seeing, or reasons that we're seeing that is actually no-shows. So, you know, kind of coming back to the secondary market, because I feel like it's, it's opened a lot of light on some of the things that have been going on. But, you know, about 10 years ago, and I'll use baseball as the example, but this certainly applies to other sports, um, when baseball did their deal with StubHub, <clears throat> they kind of legitimized the secondary market. And they told fans that, hey, it's o not only is it okay for you to go sell your tickets on StubHub, which I think is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but using it as a sales pitch. So you go out and say, hey, look, I know you don't want to go to 81 games, but here's this tool that you can go sell your tickets for for the games you don't want to go to. And so you're now selling an 81-game package to someone who might want to go to 20 games. 
And, you know, at first I feel like that worked to a decent extent, and certainly in some markets, um, you know, San Francisco when they were going to the World Series every other year, New York, Boston, Chicago, you know, there's markets where someone can do that and make money and kind of recoup their investment. They might buy an 81 game package and, you know, go to 20 games and it doesn't actually cost anything because they've resold the other tickets. But more realistically, you know, they're having difficulty selling. Maybe they're not breaking even on, you know, on their sales. And so I think what we're starting to see right now is those fans don't really want to sell tickets on the secondary market. I think a lot of times those fans aren't very good at it. So, you know, I mean, you're laughing, but it's funny. Like, if you're at the team, you know, you have all these tools at your disposal. The game's not yeah. going well. You know what? You can decide you're going to do a bob yeah. and run a promotion. You can, you can get an advertising spot to try to get people to, you know, to a certain game. An individual season ticket holder doesn't have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do it. This isn't their job. And so, you know, what we're starting to see is season ticket, hold, season ticket sales are going down. And at the same time, you know, there's this huge issue with no-show rates among season ticket holders. And that kind of comes back and it hurts the team, right? Because if, if you can't sell all your tickets, you're going to look at it next year and say, well, I went to 20 games. I was able to sell 40 games. And mm -hmm. I had another 20 that sat in the drawer and went unused. So do I want to yeah. be a season ticket holder again? And so you're starting to see this drop in, in season ticket sales across the board in addition to these no-show rates. And so I, th I mean, I think there's some teams that are doing some really smart things. Mm -hmm. um, the Mariners you know, here in town have one of the better exchange policies that I've seen. And so, you know, they let you, if you're a season ticket holder, anytime 48 hours before the game, you can return that ticket and get credit on account to use during the later in the season. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So it's, they actually have season ticket holders who've moved away, who don't want to lose their seats, who will buy the season ticket and exchange all 81 games. Oh, wow. And then, you know, when they come back, if they're back in town for a week, you know, they'll use They'll bring a bunch of friends, yeah. go to one game. You, know, you can even do something like buy a suite with that. And so it kind of creates a better experience for those season ticket holders. And then the team has the ticket, so they kind of know what's going on and can sell those directly to fans. Yeah, well, and it definitely is, you know, you and I spoke earlier and about how much something like a sporting event is about the experience. And we had talked about, um, you were telling me about how there are fewer and fewer at small events and an increased amount at the large events. Yeah, I mean, it's it, as we look across sports right now, you know, you see, you know, a lot of times, you know, empty stadiums during during the season, and you know, the teams that nobody wants to go to, they get smaller and smaller, and the big events get bigger and bigger. I mean, if you looked at the World Series last year and what tickets were going. You know, when you had Los Angeles and in the world, if you look at a Super Bowl, you almost can't price those tickets high enough, um, and people are still going to come. Mm -hmm. But the games people don't want to go to, I mean, it's the same thing on the music side. When people don't want to go and there's not a lot of interest, you almost can't give them away. And so, I mean, I think the other thing about it, and I've, I've heard some interesting you know, comments on this, on this side, is sellouts breed, breed sellouts. And so when you have, when you're sold out and when people know the stadium's full, it creates a certain vibe and an atmosphere. Yeah. And people want to go to that. You know, I think like Duke basketball is a good example. Remember, they have this tiny stadium. I remember, remember listening to, to Nate Silver talk about that. And, you know, and I kind of agree with the idea of having these smaller stadiums mm -hmm. because if you can be sold out, you create that atmosphere. People want to be there. They feel like they're a part of an experience. And yeah. that's what people want. People want to be involved and they want to they don't want to miss out they don't want to miss out on the event that everybody's going to be talking about that everybody's going to be posting about when we live in a day and age where everything is so social media um based yeah. and so yeah you know you have those smaller events and if you're filling that out then it's going to be talked about exactly and the, uh, but on the other hand to go to a stadium and there's three thousand people Mm -hmm. on a 40,000 you 
nobody walks around and feels like I have to be there. Yeah. And people kind of start saying, well, I don't necessarily want to be there. And so one of the things we actually try to work with our clients on is in these low demand situations, how do we adjust prices so we can kind of create that feeling of being full, mm -hmm. even if you're not full? So that could be something as as simple as kind of flattening out prices, so not having as big a price discrepancy yeah. between your best seats and your worst seats and try to, you know, again, just using baseball as an example because we were kind of on the topic of could you get everyone to sit downstairs and set price up in a way that incentivizes that? Yeah. And maybe the team makes... Hope, hopefully we can get people to kind of upgrade on their seats, even if it's a couple of dollars, but they make a few more dollars from the people who are going to come, and the fans get a much better experience out of it. Of course. And and as much as the fan experiencing, there's also that plays into it all, like, I think that they have a job seats, and obviously that'll affect them, if that'll affect revenue and everything, if they don't sell those seats, but what... What about the effect that can have, do you think, on like the sport itself or on the teams? Um, that's, an that's an interesting one. I mean, I think, look, when you turn on a game and you see, <clears throat> you know, empty seats and it just looks empty, it, it doesn't necessarily feel interesting yeah. in a way. It kind I mean, of connects with it doesn't matter. Yeah. But I think, but again, I think we, we kind of live in a day and age right now where things either incredibly matter <laughs> Or they don't matter at all. <laughs> right. There's, I feel there's like not much of an in-between. No, there's not. <laughs> so oftentimes the price of tickets on the secondary market is not just less than the face value, but it's less than the season ticket price. What do you believe is driving that, and is it sustainable? Um, so, yeah, another <laughs> kind of interesting <laughs> question on that one. It's, you know, I think... It is sustainable and it's not in a way. Um, if you look at when we when we started out and we started doing dynamic pricing, key thing our clients wanted. You know, they they want to protect that seat ticket holder, and so in those circumstances, regardless of what was going on, could we go below that season ticket price? And that makes sense and that works as long as the team's controlling the pricing and the team's controlling the mm -hmm. inventory. You know, once you get this sort of resale market involved and the teams don't control it, and they don't control it, and at the end of the day they don't as much as they try to, Yeah, it's going to kind of live on its own. Those prices are going to go where they are. If someone bought tickets and is trying to recoup some of their investment, that price can go pretty low. It'll go as, as low as they're allowed. And so we're always going to see that in the situation where supply out there is more, is more than demand. Baseball, partly because they make sure that you know their season ticket holders who don't want to go to games aren't sitting there reselling on the secondary. They're just giving the tickets back to the team, and so mm -hmm. the team can control what they can kind of control that flow of of supply. Yeah, absolutely, and they can direct it where they'd like to. They can, you know, send yeah. offers out to fans that they want to bring in. Exactly, and I mean, I think the other thing that we've seen is. I mean, if you look around and you look at the teams that have, you know, five dollars, six dollars tickets on the secondary market, we don't see those flying off the shelves. You know, they're low, demand's not there. But what happens is you have a bunch of people who are there competing, and you know, it doesn't sell more tickets on StubHub, for instance. It just means that hey, if I'm cheaper, my ticket's going to sell instead of yours, yeah. and so I want to make sure I sell it. So it's. It's interesting. I don't want to use the word, you know, monopoly competitive in terms of the There is at some point, you know, some of the costs going into a venue are so high from the time it takes you to get there to how much it costs you to park your car mm -hmm. to... All the hidden know, fees. Yeah, just... All get the extras, if you want to get a beer or a hot dog, 
Any yeah. other extra things you want to do while you're there for the experience? Yeah. No, I mean, the, the one that blew my mind the other day was um, I was in New York and, you know, took my wife to go see Book of Mormon. It was 30. <laughs> like, I almost literally stopped dead. I mean, it was a double, but it's a one drink and you're just like. And there weren't flakes of gold in it? There were not flakes of gold in it. <laughs> Maybe if I returned the cup after or something, it was, <laughs> but it, it just, it just blew my mind. And again, in that situation, as strange as it was, I guess it worked for them. I mean, mm-hmm. they had one bar in the place. The line was across, was across the entire theater. I think I'd rather see more bars and reasonable prices. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, probably creates a better experience, but I think they also know in a way of you're going to go to one show there, mm-hmm. right? That's very different than you know, if you are the Seattle Seahawks here and you want people to come to 10 games a year, if you, you don't want to take, you can't take everything each game. Yeah. Right? Otherwise someone's not going to come back or. Mm-hmm. No, of course, you know, it's not, it's just a, it's a different industry. Like I had asked you earlier about the differences that you see kind of between sports and other forms of entertainment. And if uh, QQ would look in, would do, get kind of put their hands in more, entertainment fields and you were kind of explaining about those kind of major differences would you share some of those again yeah Just sure what, kind and of why it's why you guys stick with sports sure i mean so there's a couple of reasons we stick with sports i mean one is one is the data you know you have these sort of repeating events and you're able to collect more data and make more intelligent decisions on it um a lot if you get to the music side becomes a bit more of a guessing game you know you're bringing you know, you're bringing Paul McCartney to Seattle for mm-hmm. his one show in 10 years. Like, how is it going to do? <laughs> Pretty um, good. Well, yeah, I'm sure it's going to, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I like the Beatles, so. Yeah, no, that's an easy one, right? As you get into the music side, work directly with the ticketing system to make this work. I mean, we provide software that ties into the ticketing system to change prices, to pull data. That relationship is with the venue. Um, This is a very US specific thing. If you go to other places in the world, it behaves very differently. But, so we need to have that integration with with the venue, but the venue's not the one putting on the show. That's the promoter. Mm -hmm. And so, totally untied. So if you were to work with a promoter going across the country, you have different stops at different venues with different yeah. relationships that have to get set up. And then on top of that, you've got the artists who are in some ways controlling price, <laughs> um, <laughs> even though they're not the ones taking the financial risk on it. And so you, it ends up being a little more of a fight for who's going to get what share of the pie as opposed to how do, I, how do we all work together and make mm-hmm. the pie bigger. Yeah. So one of the big trends in ticketing today So, I mean, we kind of talked before about this notion of kind of competitive markets on the secondary versus monopoly. You know, broker consolidation has been an attempt to solve that. Hmm. You have one broker comes in and says, hey, look, I will tell you who the rest of your brokers are on the market. We'll clear out that inventory. We'll take it all. Mm -hmm. And, hey, if we're the only ones selling tickets on the secondary market, that we're going to, you know, we'll make more money. Yeah. We don't have to compare those prices. And, you know, to an extent, I think there is some there is some benefit to that controlling it. You know, on the other hand, if you kind of look at it and if you're a team, there's a real question of, you know, what do you, what do you need this third party for versus doing this yourself? Yeah. And so I think there's clearly benefits to selling on all of these third party channels, as I mentioned before. Know, StubHub and Vivid Seats and Seat and Time have all is why would you not want to put your tickets where your fans are looking to purchase it? You know, that said, <clears throat> it's a little crazy that sort of, you know, what used to be the shadow industry of brokers is sort of financing teams. Right. If you look at who has act, who has better access to capital, it's the team. 
right? You know, a team can go to the bank yeah. and get and get a loan on the beginning of the season. You know, brokers are not necessarily in that in that situation. So it doesn't make sense as sort of the risk arbitrage. You know, if brokers don't do well, they're not going to come back on those deals. Mm -hmm. If they do well, the team's leaving a lot of money on the table. And on top of that, if I'm a team, I want to be controlling my own pricing, right? You do. Well, and, and brokers is, as we were talking earlier, brokers is synonymous with what pe what a lot of people online would know as scalpers. Yeah. You know, I, it's just turned into more of a business and some of it, some of it can be extremely beneficial to teams, but at the end of the day, you can't control if they have the team's best interest or their own. Yeah. I mean, I think the teams are ultimately going to know best how to sell their tickets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are, you know, they know the market better than anyone else. They're incented properly. Again, when you, when you sell a bunch of your tickets, you know, if someone's selling those for you, they're trying to recoup that investment. They're trying to make money. Your goal as a team may be to make money. <clears throat> it might not be your primary goal. I mean, it's, it's a little... It, it's always a little frustrating sometimes when we sit down with our clients and kind of say, okay, what's your goal? Because with dynamic pricing, we need to understand what's your objective in order to understand how to set the price. And you know, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in. We walk in and say, okay, so are you trying to maximize revenue or are you trying to maximize mm -hmm. attendance? What are you looking to do? And they're like, both. <laughs> like, okay, well, <laughs> sometimes that works. You know, sometimes that, sometimes that doesn't. Um, but I think it's one of those things that as a team, you need to understand what your objectives are and, you know, price accordingly. Yeah. Do you think sometimes it, it can require a setback to get to a long-term goal? Yeah. I mean, I think if we're starting to see some of that, um, teams willing to kind of take some chances to mm -hmm. move things in the right direction. Um, so, you know, a good example on that one's the Oakland A's. You know, the A's have rolled out at the end of this last season. Background and be part. Experience. experience exactly exactly and so they created an alternative to season tickets where you get access and you know depending on your membership level there's different clubs that you can get into and then you get so many times where you get to kind of redeem that for for a seat so you don't have a seat you're never going to resell that seat but you can show up and you might get 20 kind of seat upgrades a year and you mm -hmm. can say okay look this game I want to in the seat and maybe I want to take two seats for this game because I'm coming with someone, but some other games I'm not going to. And so, you know, there's certain, it's certainly a risk doing something like that. There might be some short-term, you know, revenue setbacks associated mm -hmm. with that because, again, you can charge a lot for a seat for everybody, even if it's not exactly what um, So. make the venue the cool spot to be every time there's a game, then more people want to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it offers more. It, you're receiving the experience you're paying for. Um, if you were on the team side, what would your top initiatives be related to ticketing and pricing? So, <clears throat> I mean, I think the top initiative right now is figuring out what that season ticket looks like. And, you know, it's somewhere, I think there is somewhere, I don't want to say between, because I think either model works, but something along the lines of that membership model um, would really help a lot of teams. Um, something along the lines of <clears throat> change policy I talked about with the Mariners would also help a lot of teams, because right now what we're seeing is teams are selling a lot of tickets. You sell these things as season tickets, and you no control once you do of what's going on. To be fair, you don't really what I sold. Like I remember I was at a game the other day and you know they, they do the the guess the attendance game going, right? 
And it was like 36,000 was the answer. And there was maybe 20,000 people there. <laughs> and I'm with the VP of ticket sales who's, and we're listening to people around. Some of the fans explain to each other, oh yeah, no, that's, that's not how many people are here. That's just how many people have paid. And that's not a great experience, right? Like you, yeah. you don't want to, you don't want to hear your fans talking about that. So I think if you could clean that up, mm-hmm. now you know what's going on. So, I mean, you can't solve a problem yeah. if, you don't, if you don't know it. And I think no shows right now on season tickets is really this big problem. And so being able to take it in a way where you control the fans, because when you sell a ticket directly to a fan on an individual game basis, they show up, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going to the box office, buying a ticket for Tuesday night's game and not showing up. So those are fans that you know you can count on. So if you can kind of create a situation where you're selling directly to fans, you know what's going on. You know, the other thing it'll also do is kind of help this price integrity on the secondary market. So again, you know, we talk about empty stadiums being a reason for other people not to go to the games. Six dollar tickets is a reason people don't go to the games either, right? <laughs> If you feel like this should be a $30 ticket and it's six, don't get me wrong. Like, there's going to be some people who are going to say, okay, this is a great deal. I'm going to go. Yeah, like, I, I love a sale. So yeah. I get excited about that. But you, it has to make you wonder. If there's, a, look, if there's a limited capacity, if you see that all of the tickets are $30 and you can somehow get one for six, that feels like a sale. That feels oh, awesome. Yeah. If you realize that any seat in the ballpark I can get for six, now you're like, there's not a lot of value to that. And it really kind of erodes the value over time and how people think about this. And people go from feeling like it's this valuable experience to it's not an interest. You mm-hmm. know, it's, is it worth my time? Why am I going to pay 20 bucks to park for a $6 seat <laughs> yeah. at the game? Entertain me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, that is a, I think that's a, a thought process you see a lot of people kind of have now. Like, well, why would I pay to go have that experience? when I have a TV at home and they, they kind of lose track of like, wait, no, remember that amazing experience, you know, like what we were talking about when you're in a a full stadium, a packed stadium, everybody's engaged, everybody's cheering for the team. That's the experience. Yeah, no, it's, and it's interesting. And you have to, you have to be at those, but people don't necessarily want to be at the other games. And so how do you, how do you create that experience? I think every conference I've, I go to on sports, there's always a session on how do you compete with the TV at home? Yeah. And, you know, that's a hard answer. And then, and then every once in a while you go, you go to that one game and you're like, wow, I had to be there. Yeah. And, you know, I remember, like, I remember going to the Rose Bowl back when Texas beat USC. I was, I was a, I was at Texas at the time. I worked in the athletic department. Long to climb the fence. I thought they did not. <laughs> that was one of those games afterwards, it was like, I had to be there. There was an, there was an experience, there was an aura to being yeah. there. And I think sports always has that. There's a, but I don't know that we can create that for, you can't create that for every game. And so what, of not. what can you create that makes people want to go? And, yeah and also feel like they get a good value out of it. Yeah. Like, right, like when we were talking before, you were talking about the, the minor league baseball team around here that, you know, you can go and you can hang out and for the cost, yeah, it's an enjoyable experience and you feel like it's worth going out for. Absolutely. It's kind of one of those things you look forward to because you know the experience you're going to get. So just on the topic of, of what you were saying, would you, I know you do more of like the background work and you kind of help price those values, but what advice could you give to somebody on the sports marketing side of it to, uh, to help them sell that price? You know, if that's the price that they've been given, what advice would you give to somebody in marketing to, to help promote that? I've never been on the marketing side in my life, so I'm going to... Oh, shoot. As, oh, shoot. As somebody, yeah. I know I'm putting you on the spot here. This yeah. is not something we talked about earlier. Yeah, no, it's not, but, but it's fine. But as somebody who decides, in theory, you know, who puts data together to decide a value, 
what advice would you give to somebody who then has to go out and make somebody believe that that value is worth it? I mean, so I think one of the place I would start, and I know this is not where you're wanting me to go, but this is where <laughs> more local mindset on it is, is looking at the different prices within the building. And so I think that's one of the things that is, in my mind, the most underrated part of pricing or ticketing mm -hmm. is the comparative pricing. Because it's not, when you go, when you're given a product, you don't just have that $30 lower, you know, upper bowl yeah. seat. There's a $30 upper bowl seat. You could spend 25 and sit in the corner. You could spend maybe 10 and sit in the back row. You could spend 100 and sit downstairs. You could spend 5,000 and get a, this huge range of what's going on. And those things need to make sense relative to each other. Definitely. And so I think, you know, the way I like to think about it and the way I would, I guess, kind of encourage someone from a sports <laughs> marketing side to look at it is there's a get-in price to that building, mm -hmm. and then there's sort of an upgrade for your seat. That's what you get for this, for this, and I feel like there's very few cases that I think that get in prices mm -hmm. out of whack with what the experience is, and so you're really kind of starting with that, and then the question is, you know, what's the upgrade and how does that make sense? And you know, I think for different people, there's different answers, right? There's going to be people who budget's not an issue and premium experience and mm -hmm. they want to you know they away from the crowds they want to be sitting courtside or in a box and there's other people who you know want to get drunk with their friends and mm -hmm. which is often <laughs> a lower ticket and you know i think trying to figure out consumers are looking for or talking to them but really kind of frame it as hey what does it cost to get in the stadium? And what do you get for that? And then what more do you get in these other situations? Yeah. Season tickets have been a main part of team revenue for years, but times seem to be changing and in many markets there is a decline in season ticket sales. Do you think that they will continue to exist? And if not, how does that impact the pricing and selling of individual game tickets? So, I mean, I think as you said, we're starting to see that decrease in season tickets, and look, it's it's been a question again for years. You hear people, are there, you know, are there going to be season tickets? And I think in certain markets, the answer is always going to be yes. I think college football, NFL, something with a ten game schedule, people can go to ten games. I think an eighty one game baseball schedule is really tough to make that work. I think. Yeah, 40 games. We're with each other because we're friends, mm -hmm. but then we don't get to go to games together. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so you're, kind of, you're not necessarily getting the behavior you're looking for. And so I think, you know, I know the topic here is pricing, but a lot of this comes back to kind of finding the right alternative to season mm -hmm. tickets because that impacts everything else. I mean, I think we've always seen from a pricing side that you have to set your season ticket price first. You have to sell your season tickets before you start thinking about things from an individual game side. Um, figure out what the next generation of season tickets looks like. And I think there's a couple models out there. It might be one of those. It might be something else. But know those are going to change but now that causes a huge challenge for staff yeah right <clears throat> you know the nice thing and again I'll, I'll use baseball because it's the heaviest on this is you know when you have half your venue full on season tickets it's a lot less inventory you've got to sell every night for 81 nights <laughs> whereas yeah. if you have 40,000 seats to sell for 81 nights that's a tough 
job. Yeah, that, I can imagine. <laughs> that's a grind, you know, especially, you know, times of year people aren't, aren't as interested. And so you know, I think, but I think that is what we're going to see. I mean, look, that's why teams employ sales forces. It's, mm -hmm. it's also, by the way, why we're starting to see the newest wave of venues get smaller, right? There was a period of time where every new venue was bigger. Everyone wanted to be able to have the max capacity for, for when things were great. And now they're realizing, wow, I have all of these seats and I can't sell them every night. <laughs> and by the way, when I can't sell them, as we said before, when it's empty, people don't feel the need, don't feel the need mm -hmm. to come because they're always going to be able to get a ticket at some later point. It's not going anywhere. Exactly. And so it's... You know, again, I think you're going to see smaller and smaller venues. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see these alternatives to season tickets. You know, the one thing I've always want, I've been tr trying to push on, I kind of always wanted to see was, you know, like Major League Baseball teams take a couple games, play them in a minor league ballpark. You know, make the season ticket package a little smaller. But then also, professional baseball game in a 5,000 seat venue and get this really cool intimate experience, kind of like the minor league experience, but no players. Yeah. And I think some things like that would be awesome. But to your question before about taking a step back before you can move forward, right? When you've pre-sold, you know, 30,000 seats already. Yeah. How, do, how can you walk away from that revenue to take, to only take 5,000? <laughs> so, I know earlier we, we had touched on this a little bit, but social media, you know, it really is so rampant in this day and age. And I'm just curious, how does social media, if it does play a role, how does it affect both the data that you collect and then um, the prices that we see? So, you know, there are companies that do a lot with social media. Ours is not one of them. We've We've tried to look into it. We've tried to play with it. Mm -hmm. um, we've never had, you know, a ton of success. You know, one of the things we kind of see is the easiest indicator of, you know, of demand is sales, right? Mm -hmm. Sale, ticket sales start picking up. You know, again, especially, I think it's a little different on the music side than it is, you know, on the sports side, right? Like on, on the music side, you can look at, you know, how much interest is there? Taylor Swift in Seattle and get a kind of a gauge on ticket sales or see yeah. those types of things trending. You know, if we see the Mariners are trending, well, does that mean Tuesday's game's going to be good? Wednesday's game's going to yeah. be good? Saturday's game's going to be good? You know, there's too much and it's hard to kind of distill there's a lot of variables. You know, what's going on, and, but you do see that with ticket sales. And yeah. so, you know, we we drive a lot of our of our algorithm based on the sales data we see. You know, we all when it's available. Have those sales fluctuate, um, which is also, you know, a pretty good indicator. You know, the other thing, and again, I think this is changing a lot right now. But when we started, when you sold a ticket, the way you sold it was you put a, you put a ticket. You know, you listed it on your website. You put it in your box office. There was no way to distinguish between two different people. Um, I think there are some better tools out there for sort of discriminating between buyers and being able to charge one person one price and another person another price. I'm not sure that we want to <laughs> go in that direction. I mean, being in Seattle, I remember when Amazon, you know, kind of tried to do some things like that, and people realized that for being a frequent customer, they were getting charged higher prices, and that did not go over terribly <laughs> well. Um, and so, I, again, I don't think teams necessarily want to do that, but... You know, the way I think, again, you have to start doing that on the team side is not by charging two different people two different prices for the same product, but figure out what Definitely. for that person. Definitely. And that's going to be different. That's going to vary by you can show someone that they get to sit in a seat that was just totally out of their reach for a better game, but they get to sit front row for this game or they get to sit, you know, right behind home plate or yeah. their 50-yard line five rows up. 
I think you can get someone excited about going to some of these games because oh, yeah. they can get an experience. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, especially if it's an experience like they either they've never had before or they uh, couldn't, you know, they couldn't afford it or they couldn't have that option. And it, it just keeps going back to you know, what we were talking about, about how people don't want to miss out. Yeah. You know, they don't want to miss out on an experience. Um, but as, as a consumer, how do I play a role in, in the data you guys collect? How do I play a role in the pricing mechanisms? I mean, a lot of it is you're making decisions, so, right? So everyone, every time someone buys a ticket, we have data on what else was available and what they didn't buy, right? Yeah. It's this huge set of data where, okay, these hundred tickets were available. You can kind of, you actually can filter that down to ones from based on what you bought. I can have a pretty good idea on what else you considered because you can kind of look at sort of comparable locations and price points and there's different variables to kind of filter that down. And then I'm able to see, okay, so out of this set of options, because you can't look at every ticket that's out there, right? You chose to buy these tickets, mm -hmm. okay? What are those characteristics about those tickets? What made that better? So it allows, you know, it allows us, for instance, to get a better sense of how valuable every row is in the building, how valuable going over a second ideal angle, all of those things. And, and that helps us kind of build our models on the world, or at least on the stadiums. And, <laughs> and from the that... The sports world. The sports world, yeah. And to be able to kind of understand how we should price these things relative to each other. Um, so it has a big impact that way. You know, it also, look, when people start, you know, buying tickets for an event, it trends up. It's like watching something, you know watching something, you know, trending on Twitter. It's mm -hmm. it's not too different, and you kind of normally get a response of, you know, if prices increase. Yeah. Some changes, at least relative to, you know, other events where that's not happening. Definitely. So I know we're, we're coming down a little bit on the clock. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I just want to make sure we had a chance to open. Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're definitely seeing teams move in that direction. I think there's a there's definitely a big trend toward going toward more exchange policies than we've seen in the past. It's something that teams haven't wanted to do. It's you want to say, hey, I sold this ticket, I'm done with it, right? So, you know, you commissioned your salesperson, this ticket's gone, don't have to worry about it anymore. The problem is we're seeing, you know, we're seeing season ticket holders not renew because, you know, they're not getting good returns or they're having difficulty selling their tickets on the secondary market. So that hurts your renewal rates and hurts your season tickets the next year. And then, as you said, how do you sell against that, right? You have tickets at the box office that you can't discount to that level, and you have this flood of inventory on the secondary really cheap. You can't compete against it. Like, I remember when we started in this business, you know, teams had big walk-ups. We worked with the Stars, and, I mean, the Stars had a relatively small walk-up in comparison, but you still, you're expecting hundreds to thousands showing up on game day at the box office. And that's, that's all gone. Um, it's very, very rare because people can go to the secondary, they can get things cheaper. And so I, look, if I was on the team side, I wouldn't want to have this direct competition. I would look at it and say, look, I'd rather sell my own inventory 
and manage and control the price. Because again, I think before it was really easy to say, I sold this ticket and the secondary market lives somewhere totally out. And it doesn't matter what happens there, I'm still going to sell when I sell in the primary. But we've pushed consumers so far to the secondary. You can't do that anymore. There are a lot of people that cross shop. There's people that don't even think to look at the primary market. And I think the more, you know, as a team, you can control the flow of inventory out there, the better. And the easiest way to do it is take your season ticket holders who don't want to have to sell a ticket on the secondary market and give them a reasonable solution that allows them to feel like they're not wasting the ticket, get some value out of it, but allow you to still manage and control the market. And so, you know, it's a big trend right now. Different ticketing systems have different and better functionality about some of those. I think back on so a reason would yeah, if we're gonna use the airline analogy, I like Southwest. Um, for their policy, I can buy a ticket. If I don't go, I keep the cash. I have some time period to use it. And, but there's no change fee or things like that. I think that's a, probably a better model in the ticketing space and making them exchange that ticket directly into another ticket because how do you manage that process? How hard and complicated is that? And by the way, I want to let someone who, you know, is, is a season ticket holder and, if, you know, if you're, you know, you've got a college program, you've got upper deck tickets for 10 games and they're not going to go to five of them and they want to have, you know, take a group of friends and sit downstairs for that last game, like, they should be able to do something like that. Like, why not give them the flexibility if you have the inventory? Anybody else? Yes. Question. So what I've seen a lot in the past three or four years is kind of uh, a shift in understanding, I guess, general retail economics. I would say because we look at sports as tickets as emotion. The reality is we're selling a product online. And models. We've seen a lot of teams benefit from that. For example, selling really expensive season uh, playoff packages. So you can sell upsell your playoff packages and increase the prices and increase the prices solely because general fans were able to resell some of those games. So they might go to game seven only, but resell the two to offset their costs. Have we come to a point where um, overpricing has not allowed folks to resell in those certain situations? Because a lot of times, and a lot of the discussion is focused around the $3 tickets, the empty seats. But what about the situations that were great that all of a sudden are turning sour because folks can't renew because they haven't been able to offset costs because the costs were too high. Well, I mean, I think the question there is, again, why are you necessarily selling that person something, you know, a package with more stuff than they want? So, right, what is the right... Money, though. <laughs> yeah. The team wants the money, right? Right, well, but the team's going to get the money anyway. I mean, one of the things we're kind of undertaking right now, and it is shockingly hard to do with these different data sources, is kind of create this full market view of what's really going on with the ticket. So, you know, if the team sells a ticket, that might go directly to, into the hands of an end consumer. It might go to someone who resells that. They may or may not be successful in reselling it. It may make it to the customer. And kind of understand of, hey, for, for a team, for instance, how much revenue did the team generate? How much did the end consumer pay? And what's that delta? And I'm, and by the way, sometimes I think end consumers might pay more. You know, in your playoff example, the end consumers are going to pay more than, than what the team sold, sold it for. And I'm sure there's, there's a lot of times where they're actually paying less. And but so, I think it starts with kind of understanding what's going on. And because look, at the end of the day, the market's as big as what those end consumers are going to pay. Right. And so, you know, the teams are. The teams are trying to capitalize on that, and they're trying to take as much out of it as possible. But you know, I think they need to kind of you kind of need to make a decision what you're doing with a broker partner is. You know, are you offsetting that risk, and are you willing to leave some upside on the table to?
be able to sell that up front. And I'm saying that as a broker partner, but that also applies to an individual as well. You know, or are you trying to capitalize on every dollar? You need to control things yourself. It's you kind of can't have it both ways. The key is just kind of having a clear, coherent strategy on what you're doing and making those decisions accordingly. Because that's what I've seen is where you know it focuses on broker, 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 but an individual who buys a playoff package because they really want to attend the game, you know, they need to offset costs. So if they cancel, that's one more ticket you have to sell. You do that too many times when you're in a win-win situation, all of a sudden the bottom falls out because you're going to have too many cancels. And that, that goes back to resale. So you're trying to maximize in the short term, but in the long term you end up pushing out actually non-broker resale. Yeah, no, I think you're, you know, I think you're right on that. And again, if you're going to try to do things like restrict resale, I think you've got to give fans alternative benefits for that. You know, and whether that's a discount on price, say, hey, look, if you're, Instead of restricting you and saying, hey, you can't resell that ticket, if, if you want to give up that right, we'll give you a 5 or 10% discount because this is what we're trying to do. Um, again, I know a lot of teams, particularly in the playoffs, are very sensitive about which fans are buying tickets. So they don't want you know, the visiting team to have a bigger percentage of the stadium than, <laughs> than their own fans. And so you know, I think there's things you can do like that. And again, the exchange policy and refunds is kind of another way to handle it. And so, you know, maybe, look, maybe in the, situ in the situation right in there, when if you get a Game 7 of a World Series or, you know, you're able to get Super Bowl tickets from your team, you can offset the rest of the whole package from that. You know, but a lot of times I think it's also, there's a lot of playoff games. <laughs> you know, can you really afford to spend that much per game for that many games and maybe offering some, you know, smaller packages of a game around is is kind of the better uh, the better way to go there. But I think a lot of it comes back to, again, trying to sell right product to the right person for the right price. And there's I don't think there's a magic answer on what that is, but that's sort of what needs to be figured out on the team side. All right. So that is all we have time for today. Barry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Emily. And for uh, letting me question you for the last hour. <laughs> um, you guys will be moving on to the next session here in a moment. Thank you for joining us.